Welcome to ABA On Call with Rick Cabina and Doug Kostowitz. Explore insightful ABA discussions. Stick around for a chance to earn a CEU. Listen for three secret words, note them, and claim your CEU after the show. Welcome, everyone, to another great episode of ABA On Call. Doug? Doing great. I'm not in my office, so sorry for the bland backdrop, but next time, maybe Legos. Okay. Yeah, I noticed nothing really cool, but then again, I don't have much to say here being in my office where you got this nice block and uh, not the not the produce thing, but what is very nice to look at is our dear friend and guest uh, coming up to be not a co-host, but guest. Uh, Manny Rodriguez. Manny, welcome to ABA On Call. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Doug. Pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Manny, Manny is the Executive Director of Strategic Growth from Puzzle Box Academy. And Manny also has his own company uh, called OBM Enterprises, where he does consulting, he publishes books. And when I first met Manny, this is one of the things that that I've come to admire and learn from him, and that is his expertise in OBM. And it just so happens that today we're going to talk about OBM. I think, like many people, you know, Doug, you were mentioning this uh, mm-hmm. before we got, we got on that, and I won't put words in your mouth, but the sense that you know this OBM, like you hear about it, you know about it, but if you don't study it, do you really know it in depth? You, you hear about it, uh, you. Yeah, yeah. More people hear about behavior analysis, but then you hear these three other terms. And I think that leads us to our first question for Manian. That is, what is OVM? How would you define? All right. Well, great question to start off. Uh, Thanks. And, um, you know, what is OVM? So OVM, in a nutshell, is applied behavior analysis applied in the workplace. It's considering what's going on in the world around us, but at work. And looking at all of the different things that make up the workplace, from policies to the vision, the mission, the values, and how all of those variables, all of those environmental factors, how do they influence human behavior in terms of employee behavior? So from time and attendance to quality of service delivery to customer service to the ins and outs of everything that people do at work, right, and what they call work or If you're looking at the problem behavior, right? So what they're not doing that they should be doing at work and asking the question, why? And that's what OBM is in a nutshell, very brief. So it's really taking that scientific approach to human behavior and just applying it to understanding why people do what they do in the workplace and how do you architect, how do you orchestrate the environment of the workplace to really bring out the best in people, as Aubrey Daniels would say. And that's one of his most prolific books, in my opinion, bringing out the best in people. But it's true. It's all about delivering, getting that positive workplace that everybody wants to come work to, everybody wants to work for, and creating that environment so that you're getting the best out of people, you're getting the right results from for the organization, and everybody, it's kind of a win-win-win scenario for everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about that. So I'm literally, you used the workplace. You're not... In school, so you think so? I was like thinking, okay, teacher maybe learning some behavioral techniques with a student. The way you would capitalize or look at OBM would be that administration working with teach the the um, larger administration working with a variety of people who are responsible for working with the people who are responsible for delivering that image. So it's. Like I said, it be is it's ABA, but it's still just you'll probably have to deal with a variety of things that teacher might not have to deal with working with a student. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not talking about one of the main differences that I tell people. What is the difference between OBM and the clinical side of applied behavior analysis? Is that in OBM traditionally you're not dealing, you're not doing one-on-one work. You're doing more macro level work. So in the context of a school, for example, if you picture a school environment, an education environment as a business, 
you're talking about OBM practitioners would work with the administrative team, the principal, the vice principals, the administrative staff to help support the teachers who are then supporting the students. Take a clinical example. So in the world of applied behavior analysis, there's lots of clinical organizations out there in the world. We're growing by the day. And what an OBM practitioner would do would work with the business owner, the executive team, the management team, the supervisory staff, who are then trying to influence on a positive uh, way to influence the staff who are then in turn working one-on-one -on -one with the kids or the, the clients, um, whatever the, like, the case may be. In my, in my years of experience doing this, I've had the privilege to work in multiple different industries. So I've worked in the education sector, primary, secondary, and even collegiate. I've also worked in manufacturing settings, both chemical, petrochemical, food manufacturing, et cetera. I've got a chance to work in telecommunications, transportation industry. Um, I've worked in healthcare, but also death care. So all these different variations of industries, all these businesses, um, OBM has been applied, not just by myself, but by colleagues worldwide. Uh, today, I kind of have two hats on. I am a clinical director for a ABA uh, company. And then my other hat is I'm actually the director of the academic arm of a school. And um, our students are all neurodiverse students, neurotypical, and then also neurodivergent. And our staff is the teachers, the paraprofessionals, the peripheral staff, the RBTs, the BCBAs. And so my job is to provide OBM a consultation to my schools and be the director as well. So I kind of work. Um, but any industry really, I mean, if you go back to um, the research and the literature uh, that dates back even farther than I've been alive, so um, since the 70s, uh, OBM has been applied in a multi multitude of industries, and that's kind of the cool aspect of it. But that's really the big difference. It's not at the individual one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's at a more macro level. You know, curious, uh, when I read about OBM, typical definitions, they talk just like you said. Uh, it looks at changing individual behaviors, and then also we'll talk about you know, changing the workplace environment and culture. That word is thrown around a lot, culture. Like, what does that mean to you? And like, what do you think about it? Like, how does a behavior analyst help change the culture? Yeah, I think, I think it truly is like a nebulous term, right? It's so vague and ambiguous. And, you know, depending on what you read, you'll see one definition versus another. So the Harvard Business Reviews of the World, the journals of management have certain, uh, certain definitions of culture that they look at. My favorite way to look at culture is actually from a professor in applied behavior analysis, uh, OBM, called Dr. Tim Ludwig. He's out of Appalachian State University. And he used to have a very eloquent way of calling culture is just listening and seeing, seeing what people do and listening to what people say. And that's what the culture is all about. It's everything that you can see and hear uh, going on in the environment. And then make, asking the question, is that what we want to see or is that not what we want to see? And so depending on what, what we see, no matter what, that's the culture. So the question is, do we want to change the culture? Well, if it's something you didn't expect to see, then you probably want to change the culture. And so I love that definition because it really boils down to human behavior. It's what people say and do. And it's the, it's the easiest, most concrete way to define it, in my opinion. So um, that's how I look at it. So when I look at my team of people, um, what is our culture? Well, are they happy or are they not? Are they talking to the side to themselves about things? Or are they speaking openly? Um, are they showing up on time or are they showing up late? Are they doing the quality... Um, the quality work that we expect them to do, or are they doing things haphazardly? And so all of those kind of uh, behaviors that we look at is in my, my definition is that's what culture is. Culture is a collection of behaviors that are very observable. And if you pay attention, you can make a decision on whether you want to maintain that culture because it's all the things you want or it's something you want to see change. Wow. I love that definition. <laughs> that makes such sense. Uh, and it's so behavioral, which is what I love. You know, you are right that, you know, culture, like, you certainly feel it. Like, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, both Doug and I work at universities and you could say, well, what's the culture in the program? What's the culture in the college? What's the culture in the university? 
But it all boils down to exactly what you said, which are worth people saying and doing. And it's, it's just very parsimonious and uh, really helps us understand well, this is culture and this is something that uh, people who are in OBM and even outside can affect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I kind of think about it too, you know, for, for your audience of, of practitioners out there that may be looking at more of a clinical side. I look at it in terms of anytime we're doing our good work as behavior analysts, we're looking to assess kind of the current state of things. So whether you're working with teachers in a school or you're working with parents in the home or you're working with executives in a business, right? You're kind of, you're looking for what is the current state of things and then asking that awesome question, is this what you want or is there things you'd want to see better or different or improve, you know? underline name that word you want to use. So whether it's one-on-one with a teacher in a classroom or with a parent in a house or with an executive in the boardroom, typically it's the same process. And to me, all we're really doing at the end of the day is defining the culture. What is the culture today? And is that what we want? And if not, what's the course that we take to make a difference? Excellent. Well, that brings us to our first secret word, which is force. Let's move in to our second question. So that that was really helpful for us to just understand what OBM is, what are some of the things it can do. And obviously, you know, within within our 10 minute sections, obviously uh, if people wanted to learn more about it, as you pointed out, there's books out there, there's many articles, it's it's discipline on its own. So uh, there's a lot more information, but maybe you, you know, with, with your experience and if there are people that are interested in OBM, maybe still in graduate school, what are things that if you're a behavior analyst, if you wanted to to go into OBM, what be examples of jobs that you could have and things that you would do? Yeah, that's a great question. So in fortunately in 2024, there are many more opportunities out there than say 10, 15, 20 years ago. In today's world, if you were to type in any search engine, words like performance improvement, or uh, in the HR world, they call it human capital, um, human performance, process improvement, uh, quality improvement, performance management in some cases, although be careful with that one, listeners, because performance management has its own uh, nomenclature and definition in the world of information technology. It's software Mm -hmm. performance or IT performance. But nevertheless, performance management is another one. And um, and in some rare cases, you might actually find a job out there that says organizational behavior management of some sort, but it's very, very rare. But those other ones, human performance, process improvement, performance improvement, all of those are synonymous with organizational change, making cultural impact, looking at human dynamics in the workplace, data collection, data analysis, all of them have those kind of similarities to each other. Um, So that would be kind of in the workplace today, what jobs are out there. Now, because of the growth of ABA in the clinical side of things, clinical ABA companies, especially more of the medium size to large scale ones, um, they are actually bringing on people uh, to take on more of an OBM role. It may be in human resources, it may be in operations, but they are looking for people with the skills of OBM to bring on that skill level into their business to improve and uh, performance, optimize processes, and then just engage the workforce in a positive way. Um, so there are a lot more job opportunities out there. Those are kind of like the key words that one would use. Now, in terms of education in OBM, I'm afraid to say it's not changed much in the last uh, 10 to plus years. There may be only an extra few more, um, a few more universities out there teaching some OBM courses or a few more CE providers that are um, providing OBM courses online. But it's still relatively small in comparison to the growth that we've seen in the field. So what I, what I tell people who are interested in OBM, especially students in our field of ABA, 
is I always tell them to go first to their professors, right? Go to their professors who know the field of ABA at large because they may have, they may not have the skill set themselves as a professor. That may not be the avenue they took, but they may know someone who knows somebody who knows somebody. Um, the other thing is that in our field of ABA, one of the coolest parts about our field is that all of those big organizations like the Association for Behavior Analysis International, the Association for Professional Behavior Analysts, they're all connected, you know, in the web of behavior analysis. So the people in those organizations, they know the OBM professionals just as much as they know the people that are doing animal behavior analysis, <laughs> right? And so students that are interested in learning more can even go to those organizations to find out where how they can get connected. Um, and then finally, I like to tell people that there are, there's an abundance of literature out there and could be at your ready fingertips and disposal to consume and kind of self uh, learn a lot of this content. Um, so the great works of Aubrey Daniels, right? His great books, and he's got uh, many of them. Um, there's even books called Organizational Behavior Management. And I'm just going to wave my, my bias card there, right? Because I have a book called Organizational Behavior Management. So um, not that you have to buy mine. I'm just saying it's out there. And the whole point of that is myself and other colleagues alike have all tried to do the same thing, which is to disseminate and educate the masses in this science. Um, so I encourage people to read, read the books, consume them, read the journals, consume them. Um, for those in, yeah, those in your audience that are board certified behavior analysts, the, the behavior analyst certification board, if you're a BCBA, you have access to the journal of organizational behavior in your portal, right? You just have to just click, 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 and you have all the different journal articles to your leisure. Uh, for so reading. mainly I got two things first. Thank you for giving me your name to contact. If anybody has me, they want to go. You're the you're you're my new OBM contact. Uh, second, <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. So as these individuals are starting to, to look, and you and you mentioned a variety of names, I I I sense that some of the similarities are when when you go out into the world, you're looking for a job that's behavior analyst. Then a long time ago, it used to be. Behavior there is behavior. And so there were these a variety of terms that had the word behavior. And none of them had sort of a behavior analytic bent. What might individuals experience may diverge from behavior analysis in kind of that performance field? Would they be so? I mean, yeah, let's say you're going for something in the whole analytic bent, where it's a whole cognitive bent. And you're going into a job and I want to be a behavior analyst, but I'm not supported there. That's not what they're looking for. What are some of the things that they would be able to look out for or could encounter as they search those names? Who are they? Who might they be? I don't want to say this. Yeah. Butting heads with. Or you kind of see, is that in your, I know my feel, but I don't know what kind of is kind of within oh, OBM. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I like to say we're going to run into the cousin, the stepbrothers, the uncles, the aunts in the field of OBM because they are called something, something, organizational, something, something. So, for example, um, I have gotten in my career the opportunities to apply to jobs, and I would be sitting side by side, in some cases literally, because back then it was face-to-face -face <laughs> job interviews, not just virtual, um, but literally sitting next to somebody on the same couch waiting for the job interview. And that person happened to be an industrial organizational psychology degree uh, person, or they had a degree in organizational behavior, which comes from schools of management and schools of business, or they had uh, something in the ballpark of an MBA or some business background. And, because, and it makes sense, right? Because as much as I learn business and organizational behavior management in schools of psychology, for many years, decades even, um, schools of psychology were introducing psychology in schools of business or school of management or schools of engineering. And so there's a great article about the history of OBM, for example, that talks about one of the, one of the main roots of our field is not just behavior analysis, but it's also industrial engineering. And industrial engineering far is uh, older than organizational behavior management and maybe even ABA because 
industrial engineering came from the world of engineering and uh, dating back to the early 1900s. And so in colleges of engineering and colleges of business, you are learning about behavior and management and philosophy and theories about management principles and things like that. And so these individuals that get these degrees like MBA or IO psychology, they have a great deal of wealth and knowledge about human behavior in the workplace. We just speak it at a different level or we look at it differently in terms of ABA. So we go toe to toe with them, right? In these job interviews, we're, we're petitioning for the same job because in those job descriptions, it says behavior, management, performance. It says the same things we're talking about. It's just, we look at things a lot differently. So the name of the game in those scenarios is how good are you at selling OBM or ABA? And if you're very good at it, then you're probably going to get that job. If they're better at it or the interviewer, which has been the case I've experienced too, the interviewer knows the language of the other candidate, they're probably going to go with what they're familiar with. I'm, I'm curious if, based off of what you said, let's say that on the other side, I am an employer. I mean, I imagine, you know, anybody could say, oh, I know OBM. I'm an OBM or like, what, what would you look for in someone who would be able to be, give you quality service as you know, someone that knows about OBM? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, I think, I think if there's a, there's a few concepts and principles that are pretty fundamental and they're, they're not going to sound dissimilar to, to you guys and your audience. Right. So when they talk, are they talking about behavior? What people say and do pretty common, pretty, pretty straightforward right to the right to the crux of things. Do they talk about antecedents, behavior consequence paradigms? Do they talk about things in that regards? Do they even use that terminology? Another one is, you know, in OBM, we do talk about the functions of behavior. We may just talk about it a little bit differently than in the clinical side, um, but the functions of behavior is still very prominent in OBM. And so is the person actually talking about the environmental factors that influence behavior? Um, and then I think another like core concept and principle that, you know, you're an OBM win is when you're talking about the use of data and data analytics and how that all plays into the role of being a good practitioner. And we're not just talking about data in terms of quantitative versus qualitative. The person would know we're talking about behavior data versus results data. And a way to know that you're not an OBMer in regards to data is when the person starts talking about more solely informant-based qualitative data like surveys, right? And nothing wrong with surveys. It's just not our bread and butter. It's not what we do. And so that person, if they're talking about, oh, I would, I would implement a 100-question survey item to all employees to get a sense of the culture, you're not an OBM or that, right? So, um, and, and so those are kind of the things that I would look for you know, you know, you're an OBM or win is, is those, uh, core concepts. Before we get to the third part, you just sounded like exactly like a teacher. I don't oh, care sure. what you perceive the child <laughs> doing. What are they doing? What are the measurements? I think they're doing better. Well, that's not going to cut it. I need to. So that brings us to our skill word. And that word is mass. All right, guys, before we go on to section three, Manny, I think you kind of answered part of this already because it was like, how do you recommend people curious about OBM get into it? You talked about it. Um, so I'm wondering, Doug and, and Manny, if maybe what we do is in this third section, unless you guys have other ideas, I'd like to maybe do a little bit more of the deep dive into some data analysis, um, which is going to be very different from and similar to what people do in ABA, but I think there's a lot of different ways of analyzing the data that, that you probably know that, that we might not know. And you know, some of that involves other statistics and, you know, whatever. I think that's great. So how do you evaluate um, when you assess, how do you evaluate, can you go into a little bit more depth into how you evaluate the outcomes of those in OBM? Because it is, such the meta contingencies you're dealing with level upon level upon level with getting those behaviors. Uh, I think, well, I think I, you know, I had 
you want me to ask the question again? Okay. All right. Okay. For the third question, we're on a term data, which we love. Um, how within OBM, what are your data points? How are you, what, what is evaluating the effect of all your different interventions? Because you have so many levels here to stay at that behavior level. How do you, when you have the meta contingencies, you have the individuals that are responsible here. What does that the data look like? What are the techniques used to evaluate that data and how to enforce your decision making? Great question. So the, the name of the game in OBM, I find, is behaviors plus results, right? And in the OBM literature, we always talk about um, performance in the summation of both behaviors and results. So when we say performance management, you're looking at both data sets. You're looking at human behavior and you're looking at the outcomes. So to give like some concrete examples, let's take this very simple one that pretty much is universally applied no matter what industry time and attendance, right? So you got time and attendance. People got to show up to work. They got to show up on time. They got to do their hours and they got, and they got to be present, right? So time and attendance. So why is time and attendance so important, right? So time and attendance is one element. We can track that data, right? Are they on time? Are they off? Are they not on time? Uh, how many days did they attend work? How many days were they late? How many days were they off, et cetera? Why is that important? Well, if you think about various industries, if people are not present, they're not delivering the work. If they're not delivering the work, they're probably not delivering to a certain customer, et cetera, and then spirals out of control and the business results will tank. So time and attendance becomes such a crucial element to pretty much any industry worldwide um, because people need to be present. So the behavior of tracking time and attendance, that data set is super important because it ties to the end result, which is typically productivity, efficiency, quality, the customer service side, if it's the sales organization, the sales side of things, if it's uh, education sector, the student's performance. Well, if a teacher's not there, how can the students perform well if the teacher's not present and all they get is a bunch of substitutes that don't really know what they're doing? Or the teacher didn't provide the substitute enough lesson plans for the substitute. You know, I could go on and on. But what about uh, in the ABA clinic side? If the clinicians are not present, they're not providing the therapy, the, the kids are not going to get the outcomes. And a manufacturing side, if the staff are not present, they're not providing, they're not producing, they're not being productive, they're not producing, that business is going to fail. So time and intent is a very simple but complex phenomenon because there's so many variables that go into why people don't show up to work on time or why people don't, you know, they miss so many days off of work and things like that. Um, so another example that I like to use is when we talk about service delivery. So in an organization that is all about service delivery, so it's not widgets and gadgets or some kind of permanent product that people are selling, like a, like a smartphone or something that's tangible, they're actually providing a service. So a teacher in a classroom, a clinician providing therapy, um, a customer service representative helping a customer out. You know, these are all service oriented um, jobs, right? Um, so then you have to ask yourself, well, how do you measure quality service delivery. And so in an OBM context, a lot of times what we do is we just simply define what does quality service delivery look like? How do you know it when you see it? You know, for a teacher in a classroom, is the teacher providing very clear instructions? Is the teacher uh, attending to questions from a student? Is the teacher providing coaching and feedback to a student that needs it the most? Um, you know, those are good quality delivery of services. A clinician providing therapy one on one. Are they following a protocol? Are they are they collecting data? Are they engaging with the student? You know, with the client. All of those are good quality indicators. So, all of those quality indicators should yield some type of outcome, and that's where the results come in. So, going back, so if we think about a teacher in a classroom, what's the ultimate outcome of a teacher? It's the student's performance, right? So, if I'm giving good quality service to the student. Am I getting the, the right outcomes from the student? On the service delivery side of a clinical therapy practice, if I'm a good clinician, I'm doing good quality service clinical therapy, is that client getting the results that we're looking for? And we can go on and on depending on what industry, but that's kind of the, the general map of it. What's the behaviors I'm looking for? Track those. 
and what's the results I'm looking for. And typically the results that we track in OBM are bottom line results, quality, productivity, efficiency, effectiveness, sales, revenue, et cetera. All right. You made it think of something almost immediately. COVID sent everybody home. Time and attended. People are saying, well, I'm getting my work done. I don't need to come back to the office to be time to be attending to get my work done. Have you run into the now aspect that results are not matching the behavior of attendance? And how is that kind of fighting each other at this point? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I used to work virtually for many years um, for consultancies and um, a manufacturing facility and then for myself as an entrepreneur. And a lot of times when it comes to a virtual job, you don't really. So an OBM practitioner, I would say, arguably, most of us would say, you only have to measure time and attendance if the product is related to okay. time and attendance. So for example, um, a call center. So call centers are typically people that work from home. They're answering phone calls off of an online system. Well, they can only answer calls if they are present and accounted for online, right? So similar to an online teacher, a teacher can only perform if they show up, right? So time and attendance would make sense on a, on a virtual platform if the job itself required time and attendance. Now, the alternative and kind of what I think you're speaking to more is what do you measure? What, what's the performance data that you look at when the job doesn't matter if they work two hours or eight hours, but what really matters is the product right. that they deliver, the, the, the work that they're doing. So for example, um, most recently I experienced this. Um, I'm writing, I'm writing a book and I wanted somebody to edit the book. I don't care if the editor takes an hour, two hours, four hours, five hours. I just want quality editing feedback, right? So the editor says, well, I think I can edit this book in about three, four hours. And here's my price. So I said, okay. And they actually got it done in half the time, but the price is still the same because of what I'm paying for is the actual gotcha. product, the feedback of the editorial. And so to me, um, from an OBM standpoint, that's what we have to evaluate. Is the job itself required based on time and attendance, or am I requiring a certain product at the end? So if it's a product at the end, and in COVID time, what we really learned was really focusing managerial, executive leadership's time on the permanent product if time and attendance was not the indicator of success. So what's the output? What's the, out, what's the, what's the product that they should be delivering? And then evaluating that product. So in the world of ABA, for example, I've had my fair share of reviewing behavior plans and working with BCBAs all over the world and looking at their behavior plans. And I don't, I don't ask them, how long did it take you to rate this? What, I, what I'm looking at is the product itself. You know, did they include this? Did they include that, et cetera? And so it, it's that taking off that, that hat and saying, I don't need time and attendance. What I need is good quality outcomes. What's your... So you are dealing with administration, you're dealing with the executives. What if they're telling you, we want these people back and we want them here, even though we know that they can do just as good a job there. We don't, it's kind of an old mentality versus, because I, I scum the parallels oh, yeah. to me walking in to tell a teacher, hey, you really need to start doing this because what you're doing isn't working. And they're like, well, I've done this my whole career and it's worked. And it's, I feel like you get to sell jobs sometimes, right? As you're, as you're trying to get there, it's like, oh, yeah. and the only way you do it is shove down. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in this topic. I'm dominating. No, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think there's a, there's some, there's some stories here, but you know, I think, I think that's, I think that's cool. Right. Because what you're, what you're reflecting is. There's a scenario out there, right, where you're hitting a wall. And, and I think OBM practitioners feel this way all the time. You're hitting a wall, right? You're saying the data doesn't say to us, it doesn't scream to us, oh, we need eight to four. You know, we need nine to five. Um, but there's kind of that bureaucratic, like, 
red tape that's in there that says, no, no, absolutely, nine to five, no ifs, ands, or buts, even though we know we lose 40% productivity. And so, unfortunately, I would say we're right. stuck, right? Because if that, if that's the regime, if that's the regime's thing, and you provide all the data, you provide all the information to them, and they're still in that mindset, then I would say they're stuck in the past and they haven't really looked at the data and looked to evolve. Un, uh, dissimilarly, if you look at organizations like Google and Apple and Amazon and uh, other companies that have taken that virtual context, that virtual employer, and they've really done a great job at saying, I don't care how many hours a day you work, I care about what you produce. And so a lot of these, these companies that are multi-international companies, you know, again, it's all in context, depends on the job. They, all those companies still have jobs that require a button seat for time because of the job itself. But for those jobs that are more, I forget the term, but I'm going to use a term that I know. There's another term for it, but it's called knowledge workers is the, the word that I know. Um, it's where the person is a thinker and produces based on thought and their behavior is whatever they produce. So think like an architect doing blueprints, <clears throat> uh, a professor doing research, right? Uh, without students, that is just research. Uh, theoretical research, uh, concepts and principles, you know, things like that. Um, nothing applied, just kind of conceptual. Um, think of a, a philosopher, a writer, you know, people that are thinkers or knowledge thinkers and don't really require that nine to five to do the work that they're destined to do. Um, outside of those jobs, I think most organizations are still in that mantra nine to five, eight to four, whatever. And until we, I don't think that's ever going to go away. I think what all our job is to do is to educate and use data to say, it doesn't really make sense to hold this person accountable for eight to four because they can produce more with less hours, but it's a hard pill to swallow when you tie in a salary and benefits and things like that. So, so it is, it, it's a tough sell. There's no doubt about it, but I think if we, as OBM practitioners, if we see the opportunity to try to pitch it and try to sell it, what I have seen is that when a company does focus on that person's ability to produce, they're going to get more, more outcome from that person, from that individual, from that role versus holding them accountable to the nine to five. Well, that brings us to our third secret word, which is an acceleration. Perfect word. <laughs> and that also brings us towards the end of our podcast. Uh, Manny, uh, this, this conversation, there's like a hundred questions I haven't asked you yet. And I'm Let's sure Doug can say the same soon. thing. Yes, we do have repeat guests. I'll do it again. And for people... That, like, that are like Doug and I who have more questions and would like to learn more about what Manny's saying, I want to direct you all to Manny's LinkedIn page. That will be in our show notes. Uh, Manny has a wonderful book out called Organizational Behavior Management in its second edition, updated, and something I could recommend to you all. And anything else, uh, make a form a connection with Manny. And if you're interested in an OBM, certainly uh, follow up on his work. Manny, thank you for your time. This is thank you very much. Uh, thank, you thank you guys. You. It's been fun. Thank you guys. That's the pod. Thank you all for joining us at ABA On Call. Thanks for watching this episode of ABA On Call. To get your CEU, follow the link and instructions below the video. You can enjoy the program again there, or you can go straight to the attendance verification quiz. Just enter the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate.